Hello. Welcome to the Dark Path Podcast. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to introduce you. So, sure. <laughs> this is uh, John Foster, and we, uh, uh, we, we connected because we both have a very uh, fond interest in Japanese folklore and mythologies. Um, I come in it from a martial art point of view, having trained for a long time. But I would love for you to just tell everybody kind of like how you got into that, what a bit of your own background in that sense, and uh, see where it goes. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was born in Toronto, Canada, and um, basically what I studied was science and psychology. And um, when I finished, I, I put myself through school, and I really had no money at the end of graduating. So in Toronto, I went to McMaster University in, in Ontario and uh, graduated and said, okay, it's time for me to see the world. And uh, I just put through happenstance, a friend of mine, a girlfriend I was dating, and she said her brother was teaching English in Tokyo. She said, you're, and I had been teaching, so I was one of the t teaching assistants at uh, McMaster for the, the Psychology 186 course at the time. Okay. And I'd done that for two years. I was pretty proficient at uh, teaching, so she thought I was appropriate for that. So she said, why don't you just apply? And I just threw my resume out and ended up in in Tokyo and I taught for a little while and then um, you know because I had advanced degrees I was able to meet people and got a degree or sorry got a position at uh, a university in Japan hmm. in Tokyo and I was teaching there for a while and I wasn't really again I didn't have a lot of money so I didn't spend a lot of time in the bars and partying and having fun at that time I did later in my life <laughs> but at that time I didn't so I spent a lot of time uh, walking around and not just Tokyo but I would take very simple trips but long trips out of the city into the countryside mm. that's how I became familiar mm. with um, the lore the folklore okay. of uh, rural Japan you don't have to go very far outside of Tokyo to find small towns where you can meet people and they're open to conversation yeah. and I got to know Japanese folklore that way I never really started off for example a lot of people go to japan with the idea of getting into buddhism or mm -hmm. studying shinto or i never did that I, I i i found japanese belief from the people great so that's the yeah. the, the way that that started well what er what area of japan would this been uh well, I lived right in the center of Tokyo. So, 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 so it's just so, outside of Tokyo you're talking about the little bit yeah, just immediate to that. Up right. north, out west, and small uh, little towns around Tokyo. You, you have to go pretty far, but the, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the trains are quite efficient. I've you, heard. You can get out there. <laughs> okay. And then you get out to the countries and you, you find these little towns and they're uh, mostly depopulated. Hmm. There's not very many young people, hmm. most of whom go to Tokyo to find jobs and excitement things like that so uh, you get but if you do go out and you find and I'm, I'm talking you have to go pretty far out obviously but to, when you get into the countryside you find a lot of small towns so that's how I became familiar with the folklore okay and um, so what I did uh, after that of course I you know did my master's degree and I worked through various teaching positions came back to Vancouver when okay. my children were ready to be born in 1999 oh so my wife is from southern Japan uh, but we came here and we bought a big house in West Vancouver okay. and we were living the life mm. and she said she became kind of sad that she was the kids were not seeing insects and I was going like what do you mean <laughs> insects uh, and not, not seeing you know like nature the way it mm. was meant to be and the way she grew up she's from a very small town in wow. southern Japan Kushikino in Kagoshima okay. so she said she wanted to go back so we sold our house and I was planning on what am I going to do when I go back. Obviously, I would teach at the university, teach English. But, but what else did I want to do in life in Japan? And I had this concept of the folklore, the people, the, the belief of the people. So I went back and I took, I studied, read a lot of books. I read Jung, uh, C.G. Jung, the psychologist. Yeah. And I read uh, Joseph Campbell, yeah. the mythologist. Yeah. And I decided that I would just go and take a very, you know, not very... Uh, very serious program, but quite quite interesting program in Santa Barbara down in California. Hmm. So what it involved was flying down from Vancouver once a month for about a week. Okay. I'd arranged that with the, the, with the, the university I was working at here, and I was able to get some people to come to my classes. And I did that for two years. I flew down every wow. month. It was quite expensive, but it, yeah. was, it was worth it. Okay. Uh, a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. We learned a lot of... Uh, of mythology and then I decided that's what I decided okay so I'm ready I'm, I want to go and study uh, 
and over that time, I had became familiar with the more familiar with myth, with the uh, mountain kami, which is in English mm. called mountain kami, and uh, Japanese yama no kami. Mm. And I decided I was going to do research on that mm. particular topic. So with my wife, we arranged to give up everything here and go live on a farm in southern Japan, wow. which we did. And from that farm, I, I began my research. I spent a whole year and a half without teaching. And then I eventually started teaching as well. But just working the farm with my wife and her, her hometown is nearby. So we father who was, had retired and we did a lot of organic farming, like traditional <laughs> farm, like farming the way it was done hundreds of years ago. Oh, wow. And uh, without a lot of chemicals involved. Sure. And just I did that. And I did research. And I interviewed people. And I under, tried, got, tried to get an understanding of what the mountain kami was. And that's when I discovered that um, there were multiple um, facets to the mountain kami belief. Yeah. And uh, I focused on three eventually okay. uh, in my writing and document I made a couple of documentaries on that as well. Oh you did? I didn't know that. Yeah, so oh. that's that's how I are they available it. like online for people to see? Yeah, I put them online at um, uh, temporarily at a Wix site okay. and uh, uh, called Folk Myth Media. Yeah. And I will uh, I'm going to put them up on a more serious uh, blog uh, research when, when I have more time yeah. to get that together but yeah. I definitely would be happy to post that though because oh I appreciate it yeah that, that, that's I'm gonna watch it now <laughs> that's oh, yeah. interesting um, there's so many aspects to that that I'd like to just you know explore because it sounds fascinating and just especially idyllically learning it on a farm where you're just engaged in the process because one of the things that came to my mind immediately when you're talking about the the folklore and the mythologies and this would be true I think mostly anywhere mm -hmm. is they're born out of the lifestyles of the people that live at those times. And I know that in Japan, there's a, a whole tapestry of amazing folk art and folk knowledge about whether they're, uh, the way they used to put traditional houses together with the joints on, in, the, in the wood mm -hmm. to the uh, big central cooking pot mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the dwellings. Um, I saw a little short documentary thing about a, a, a I guess you call it like a stew or soup that gets made in Japan that mm -hmm. that you have to brew for like a day or two before right, it right. gets to and like all of that stuff to me is, is it's a it, it has to be part of that mythology right like it's connected to those day to day experiences sure so being able to like actually experience that directly that's really interesting yeah well, as a side it's not a big thing but just a side note were you farming rice no no we were um, we were farming. Um, the, the, the village that we lived in, um, the, the people who own, uh, so basically the structure of all these small towns, they're called Shuraku. Okay. Um, Shuraku, so the village, the village I lived in was Arakawa, okay. uh, outside of Kushikino town. And it's up a very narrow, very narrow uh, river valley. Mm -hmm. So there's a river, and that's very typical of Japan, generally speaking, and especially southern Japan, mm -hmm. where the mountains are quite so high because it's older, mm. it's a little softer mountains, but they're steep. Okay. So, and so it's a fairly well cut okay. valley. Okay. And so in the center, there's the river and the rice paddies, but they're all owned by traditional families. Okay. For, uh, in, in the case of Atakawa, um, it's pre Kamakura. <laughs> so we're talking Way thousands yeah, of years yeah. and these people have their family yeah. date almost all the date, families date back so if you own a rice field in that valley you oh, have you been there for here. thousands <laughs> of years you're not just walking and say oh, i'm gonna run <laughs> grow some rice here right? okay okay but we we on the other hand the family that we rented the farmhouse from yeah. and their their new kind of modern western style house which they liked and i was like why would you want to live there it's a beautiful old farmhouse they gave they rented that out for ah. us but only because we had a lot of connections. They, they were not. They would not just rent that out. Wow! So, and you could just walk and say, "Can I rent this?" Really? Uh, we we had my wife's father was one of, was one of the um, he was um, a, one of the top guys in the in the in the region, uh, the city office. Okay. Uh, so he had a lot of connections, and he was really well liked. So we were able to find this apart. This uh, this. Uh, old style farmhouse, a huge farmhouse. Cool. Massive house. Yeah. It was, but. The way it's structured is, um, I don't know if you can imagine this, but there's like, it's, there's like, in this, there's this kind of very narrow, I'd say maybe 400 meter wide, 500 meter wide valley that's okay. flat okay. with a river in the center. Okay. It's been diverted a couple of times to, in post-World War II to make mm. it a little more efficient. Mm. 
but that's the structure. Then you have this kind of elevated area at the foot of the, the foot of the mountain, which has all of the housing. Okay. And there's a few houses that go up a little bit into little river valleys, but mostly they're all together, gathered together. Okay. I lived in the Nakamugi uh, Shuraku. Uh, it's kind of like a kinship group. Okay. With, it, there are five different family groups <laughs> that exist there. Wow. And it's fr- pretty much structured. Huh. So it's just a, it's a structure that's existed, for, as we said, for millennia. Yeah, it sounds yeah. millennial. And from there, in front of the, each house, there's a, a kind of a like a terraced uh, area where vegetables grow. Oh. And that's what we grew. We, oh. we mostly focused on vegetables. We had um, um, a pretty, pretty big area to work with. And um, so basically, uh, that's what we did. And, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the thing. So, but, but you're talking about, um, let's talk about the gods. So, for example, yeah, that area, so if, if, for example, if I'm saying the house is here Hmm. and the uh, vegetable area is here, I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera, but but right there, there is what we call an uchigami. Hmm. Uh, Ujigami. Okay. Ujigami, uchigami. So these are two um, expressions of particular types of gods that exist in throughout Japan okay. and there are Uchigami areas and Ujigami areas. Hmm. Sa- old Satsuma where we live which is modern Kagoshima it's it's a, it's a kind of a complex unclear mix it's the only place where Uchigami and Ujigami both are coterminous they, they exist together hmm. and it's it, it's that's the nature okay. that's the element that I studied and it's quite interesting so can, can you can you can you explore the difference between the two though so if somebody like I, I'm not exactly sure what how you would quant, uh, quantify each either or sure or whatever. well Uchi means uh, it's, it's, it's focused on a border okay so Uchi itself means house for example currently sure. you can say my my house Uchi sure uh, it's the area within which I live but the gami part is the kami. Right, yeah. yeah. So it's the god that protects that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the uchi idea. Okay. The uji is related to, um, uh, for example, don, uh, the, the, the great ancestors. Hmm. The ancestors who protect. Hmm. So it's more focused on ancestral worship, whereas uji is more focused on a kind of a amorphous sort of god it's more like you're protected but it's it's a it's the kami but not not really necessarily connected to the ancestors but even in the ujigami areas it's not really strongly ancestral huh whereas in satsuma it's very strongly huh very strongly connected to the ancestors and uh for example, one of the examples is Saigo Takamori. Yeah, we yeah. talked about him before. Yeah. Quite famous uh, yeah. Satsuma, yeah. Um, um, lower-ranking samurai, okay. uh, who became nevertheless a great uh, hero yeah. of that yeah. area. So, yeah. so they the most about five years ago, I guess four years ago, there was a great NHK drama. Hmm. You know these NHK dramas where they run for six months and oh, every, yeah. every day is yeah. like fifteen minutes. It was called Saigo Dong. Uh, so Dong is linguistically linked to Uji. Right. So Uji Ko right. are the great leaders of a town. Hmm. So the Uji, the Don, Ujigami, all of that's linked in Kagoshima. It means the ancestors that protect. Yeah. In times of crisis. Yeah. And that's important. It's in times of crisis. They don't. They only come down in times of crisis. Right. Whereas the Uchi is the continual protection of the house. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, and so, because it's like so much of these beliefs, there's this wonderful weaving of them all. So there's right. very difficult to put like an Archimedean point to it and say exactly. this is that. Yeah, that's, but that's so interesting too, because um, you're bringing up uh, uh, Saigo Takamori mm-hmm. and, and his role. Um, I, I would like to explore a little bit about, I guess, how, how the folklore traditions might have been affected by the post-Meiji Restoration times. Okay, sure. Because he, you know, he people that may not know this, um, but he definitely is one of the main inspirations for the idea of the last samurai. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And and that idea of that desire not to go into the new age that the samurai were dying, you know, right. were finishing the samurai. So that's a whole thought there that I would love to explore in some degree. So um, I'd like to maybe explore uh, the, the background a little bit of Japanese folklore mythology. Um, 
what it is and how it and how it differs maybe from other mythologies to some extent. Sure. Yeah. Um, I know at the center of it, um, and even exploring a little bit of what Shinto is, because Shinto is at the center of it, I, I understand it, because that's the actual indigenously cultivated belief. And then Japan has Im imported uh, Zen Buddhism, Buddhism uh, yeah. not just Zen Buddhism, but Buddhism, as well as Taoism, and then some other influences kind of teasing yeah. around the edges. Sure. So yeah, could you, could you try to sort of paint that picture, that framework? Well, as far as I know, um, it, 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 referring to uh, the mountain kami, the mountain kami derives from um, a, a mysterious character from the Upper Paleolithic, hmm. and her stories. She's referred to as the mistress of the hunt, hmm. and she was the huntress, and she was the goddess of the the land of of hunting. Huh. So uh, hunters, before going into onto onto the the, the, the party, the war party, they would uh, go through a lot of uh, ritualistic sort of uh, um, acting and um, drinking and thinking and doing all kinds of things that we're not really quite sure of. But um, certainly it's, it, they, there was a passage hmm. from the land of the humans hmm. to the land of the gods. And that's the way it was um, con conceived in terms of Mr. Sulhan. So who you were uh, paying tribute to was the mistress, was a, was a female goddess of hunting. Hmm. And she would help in the hunt. And that's um, uh, Nalman, Nelly Nalman, the ger great German uh, researcher. Is that's, that's where that would come from if someone wants to go back and read okay. her work. She's done the most uh, intensive research on that. And uh, it seems that it's, there's a this particular belief system, the mythological system, uh, extended into Greeks. For example, uh, Artemis shows mm. the, the Greek goddess Artemis shows similar elements of uh, pure raw nature huh. uh, and hatred for the for the uncouth civilization, hmm. and to pass into the wild, the pure wild, you had to. Um, you had to, to show that you were ready. So there was a lot of ritual acting. Okay. So the, the, the stories, the myths came with the ritual. There's a, there's a, of course, in the literature, there's a large debate between the ritualists and the mythologists. And the, hmm. I'm, I'm a believer that they, they both, they, they neither can live separate. There's yeah. no stories without uh -huh. acting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they acted out what they were going to do. Okay. And how they would uh, act within what's what were the proper behaviors yeah. in the land of the gods? What huh. were the proper uh, ways of killing and taking um, game? Yeah. So these things had to be done based on what the goddess uh, demanded. Huh. Otherwise, you would die on the on the trip, or something would happen to you. Uh, same, and that belief was inherited into Japan as as the mountain. Mount. Hmm. So the mountain kami is female. Nobody knows why. Hmm. Um, Nelly Nauman has said the reason why is because it's the Mr. Salahat. I mean, it's, it, it's controversial, it's debated, but she, she's done really good research, and I believe I, that's, what, that's what I follow. Okay. So she is exactly that. She, to cross, to, <laughs> to cross into, and Japan, in Japan, in the case of Japan, it was quite interesting as well because it, it, it matched perfectly the, the natural environment. Hmm. So Remember what I was saying that there's the river valleys, mm -hmm. and you've got this valley where there's this kind of fertile area. Of course, at the time during the what we call the Jomon era, mm -hmm. pre-Neolithic revolution, mm -hmm. uh, there was no rice mm -hmm. farming at all. But the people lived up above, close to the mountains, but not in the mountains. Sure. There's a border. Yeah. There's a border, and and one of my one of my great um, interviews for my documentary was with a with a great Shinto priest, uh, Shimazu, mm. who was a descendant of the Shimazu clan. They headed the Satsuma clan for th yeah, pretty much 800 years. Okay. They still do head the Shimazu, okay. but they, maybe they're waiting to, to take over again. <laughs> but but he, he told, what he, what, the way he described it is this. In the, in the past, there was like this sense that there's a border yeah. between the land of the kami, yeah. the gods, and the land of the people. Yeah. And people would go to that border, and before they went into hunt, and hunting was the main source of uh, nutrition at that time. Okay, they would uh, proffer themselves to mm -hmm. the gods. They would, they would, again, ritually act. Yeah, and uh, I've, uh, I've in my my book in my my research, I've, I've shown that uh, it still existed quite to quite recent times. Yeah. that men would act out 
the, um, the, the, the idea of approaching the land of the kami hmm. and how to hunt. They would actually help if we were like seven guys that were going on a hunt, even though we had rifles, <laughs> we would be using, we would, we'd, someone would, someone called Shiba Boy. Shiba Boy. Shiba is like old, uh, the kind of like driftwood that you would find in okay. BC, but in that case, it would just be wood that you find at the edges of the mountains. And they bring it together, they tie it together, and they make the, they make a deer. Hmm. That was his role. So hmm. say I was Shiba Boy, I would get out, go out early in the morning, I would prepare that, hmm. and I would act as if, and, and most researchers believe that I would, I believe that I was possessed by the mountain kami. Hmm. So the mountain kami comes down into a fire, a bonfire, and then possesses my soul, and I teach the other people. And if you were one of the other hunters hmm. preparing to go on the hunting trip, you would pretend you guys were five or six of you would be walking around dancing. Oh, we're on the hunt, <laughs> we're, and we're talking, and I would pretend to be the mountain kami. Huh. You would pretend to be, uh, though I didn't think I was pretending. I yeah, thought, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it was a, it's a belief system, yeah. and we were we would end up shooting this deer. Mm-hmm. And that was one aspect. Mm-hmm. Another aspect um, in uh, Arakabu, I think I mentioned Arakabu to you once before, uh, is an f- old fish. Right. An ugly fish, a rockfish, really ugly. Yeah. But the mountain kami loves it. <laughs> so they would have it wrapped up in a white paper. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And they would keep it. And the Shiba boy would take it out and show it to everybody. And everybody would laugh at it. And he would pretend to be sad that you were laughing at my... My, my fish, because I love my fish. And th- these sorts of things are, are, are part of the belief yeah. that the mountain kami is a god that is harsh, but also has emotions and has feelings and expects something of you. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. And so that was the area. So yeah. just, just back to Shinto, if, if you're in Shinto, the idea of the gate, she, Mr., uh, the, the priest, Shinto... Uh, priest that Shinazu yeah, yeah, says yeah. that began with these ritual acting. Yeah, the place where they they entered regularly, they event that those places eventually became right the uh, Shinto Tori. Yeah, so that idea of the gate into the mountains comes from the idea of playing around, having fun, getting ready to actually go into the dangerous, quite quite dangerous. I mean, even. Yeah, you can imagine how dangerous it must have been. Like the, yeah. the rough terrain. Yeah. Uh, once you once you do have a chance to get into Japan and you go into these mountains, it's it's really dangerous walking. Mm. And uh, sure. so that, that's how that one. Yeah, that's very fascinating. There's again, there's like all these different points I, I pull on. Like, yeah, sorry, I kind of went yeah. off on a. But that, no, it's <laughs> great. It's great. I, I, yeah. These conversations are fascinating. So so you know, one of the things I hear from that though, especially when you brought up the idea of comparing this. Uh, goddess of the hunt yeah. concept with uh, uh, Artemis, I think you say her name is Artemis. Yes. Artemis, Artemis, and um, who's her equivalent? Diana is the is the, uh, the Roman goddess the Roman yeah. version of it, right? Yeah, yeah, and and so so it seems to me that when you go back far enough in that Paleolithic era, mm-hmm. that what you get is these animistic sort of shamanistic belief systems. Correct. Sure. And there seems to be that they're basically, and I don't want to say basically in a reductionist sense. I just mean that as trying to get a framework of them. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Is, is and you put it so well is this this relationship to the wild and to mm-hmm. nature because yeah. nature is both judgmental and giving right so right. it's your sustenance plus you might die too right, right. you have this dynamic exactly. and you know in those cultures from my understanding a lot of the uh, deities are gen- are female because uh, the females um, represent both that judgmental aspect of nature right but also the life giving aspect of nature sure um, and and it's fascinating it's connected to hunting because I imagine that. A good motivation for a lot of Paleolithic men was to hunt for the women, right? Right. And so there's there's a balance there, um, and so so I so you see I, I see anyways is this relationship to that uh, to that unknown slash nature slash external world that you need to engage with but is dangerous to engage with, right. and then people will pick up on bad behavior patterns that work best, yeah, and then they start to pay attention to. Oh, it's my state of mind is a big part of that. How do I enter into it in my own self in right. that sense? So um, I see this being manifest all the way down to like modern martial arts. Sure, oh, absolutely. So um, even even like a, a, I'm not a big fan of tournament style of martial arts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's not my favorite thing. But no, I respect it. I don't want to diss it. I just right. not, I'm attracted to it myself. But if you watch even a person in a performance like that, you can see that the first thing to do is to sort of bring their body into a centered position, and right. then there's a bow. Right. And that's 
I'm coming from my center and I'm coming respectfully and right. now I can enter into this thing I'm going to do. Sure, sure. And I see that model being there with that hunt too, right? Right, right, right. Absolutely, and, yeah. 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 And and but and I I like how you also brought up like I've heard of the, the wrapping of the fish being compared to actually techniques you learn where you uh, wrap around, right? And right, right, yeah, yeah. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can always make those comparisons to the right. things, right? But um yeah. but more to the point of what you were saying is of a give and take. Mm -hmm. And 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 a recognition that you're not gonna get something for free from nature. Nature's right. gonna have a demand on you. Yeah. Um and then that comes back to that whole idea of how you're approaching it. Right. In that sense, and I can see belief systems building up out of that. Right. So, so do you think then that that's exactly essentially what happened? Is that Shinto is like a, a, an evolution of these more early shamanistic style? That's what I've been told. I, 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 um, maybe not necessarily shamanistic, but uh, but certainly the the concept of the the borderline between. Yeah. So there, there is a because Shinto means the way, right? Okay. As Do is the road. Do meaning road, mm -hmm. and um, the the coming way. Yeah, yeah. The way of coming, uh, the way of going. How to to live and how to approach life. Yeah. So Shinto definitely began uh, from the roots of Kami belief. Uh, there's no question. But it was it was not so strongly formulated really until uh, the advent of Buddhism, mm. uh, where uh, there was kind of a, a, a push on it to, to, to formalize it and to to provide some sort of uh, mm. uh, you know way of saying this is what we believe. But whereas the truth is that the Kami belief was quite widespread, was was everywhere, but it was very different. Like you, you yeah. could go from one little hamlet to the next hamlet, and there would be differences yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah. so that's that was i'm sure that's true throughout the world at that one point i'm sure but uh, uh, it's definitely definitely shinto tried to gather it together yeah. as a kind of a balance to to the to the quite impressive uh, uh and well organized yeah. uh thought uh philosophical thought of buddhism sure so that occurred early and even the even we can say the classic uh the classic texts like the kojiki mm. and nihon shoji our um, our responses, yeah. really too, and and kind of a, a how, how can we say like a, a a way of collating the thought. Yeah. So you'll see, a, for example, you'll see in the Kojiki um, um, Amaterasu. Are you familiar with? I, I I know the name, but it, the sun goddess. Yes, yes, that's right. And she's fundamental to to uh, Shinto yeah. belief. Yeah. You go to a Shinto shrine, they'll have a mirror. That mirror is yeah. symbolic of Amaterasu. Yeah. And it's in the classic text, uh, Amaterasu is the sun goddess, but she has this brother. Uh, and her brothers are kind of troubled. She has two brothers, but the one, Susamu, is a troublemaker. Right. And he's, uh, and I mean, you know, the way myth, myth, classic myth tells stories is, can be quite brutal. So yeah. what he does is in, in, in the Nihon Shoji and in the Kojiki, he does different things. But it, for example, one in one story, he actually flays uh, Amaterasu's um, assistant uh, mm. helper and he just does, does a lot of sure. evil, evil stuff right yeah and so she gets so upset that she hides herself in uh. the cave in which is in which is said to be in the kirishima mountains um, uh. in modern uh the satsuma region but modern Miyazaki and kagoshima the kirishima mountains are in between okay and so it's right there okay. uh you can actually go to the cave <laughs> it's still in this you can see the cave uh she she locks herself in that cave yeah Puts a rock in front, hmm. and the world goes dark, mm. and the monsters come out, mm. the evil comes out, and all the kami gather and they say, "What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do to get her out?" So they basically uh, um, they decide to have a matsu, hmm. kagura, kagura meaning dances for the gods. Oh yeah, yeah, kagura. So they they have this kagura. They start dancing and singing and they're drinking and having fun. Everybody's enjoying and they're having fun and so. It goes on, it starts from when she enters the cave, everything goes dark, they start doing it, they keep going until she comes out. How do they get her out? They um, they can't get her out, they can't figure out a way to get her out, but she's definitely, she keeps peeking out. <laughs> everybody's having fun, right? Yeah. Everybody's having this, this fun. Yeah. And she's going like, what's going on out there? And she, she keeps, and then she closes again. And she's, what's going on? Everybody's having fun. They can't be having fun. There's no sun, hmm. the monsters out, the world's, coming to, to an end. Interesting. So one smart, uh, I can't remember his name, one of the kami 
um, thinks of an idea. He says, why don't we put a mirror in front of the cave huh. and we'll get the strongest kami to stand behind the stone in the bushes and we'll just keep playing and when she comes out she's going to see herself hmm. and she at one, so that's what happens she opens up the rock at one point she's, everybody's having fun she's going and she sees this beautiful woman hmm. she goes why is this beautiful woman out here hmm. have, and everybody's having fun with her and she opens a little further enough so this big strong man pulls the rock out and uh, then the sun opens up again uh, but it was the fun and the, all yeah. of the activity which is also part of what happens in uh in uh, local kami belief right. so i in my book i write a story i actually i wrote a i wrote a, a early 2014 um essay for the uh journal uh, the, uh, the journal of uh, the Anthropolo anthropological society of oxford okay. and it's just published so people can take a look at that and it uh basically talks about uh an a, a, a play in which i acted <laughs> and I was Amaterasu. Oh yeah. I was, but not Amaterasu. Actually, I was the, I was the mountain kami. Ah. And the mountain kami also realizes how ugly she is because, and that's how the fish comes into play, and she sees herself in the mirror. That so that there's many versions of the story. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So classic myth took one version yeah. and set this version. Right. And that became Shinto. Okay, I, I'd like to pick up on that for a sec. Sure. But, um, that's a fascinating, fascinating. Um, story um, and I appreciate how at the end you were talking about how there's different interpretations of the story and it, it manifests in different ways because um, I, I, had a, I did a podcast I haven't uploaded it yet but I'm just finishing the editing on right. Monday with a guy um, who's I met him he's uh, running as a was running as a PPC candidate in uh, the Vancouver Island oh, area yeah. where I grew up and anyway so I was talking to him and He'd done some studies where he or been involved with some studies or something where he was talking about how dialectical differences in regions differ equi in an equivalent way to geographical um, diversification in that sense. Okay, yeah. So prior to European colonization, BC had like 60% of the languages in, in Canada for the indigenous populations and the other 40% were spread out across the rest of the country. Oh. Be and, it, and there's a correlation between the amount of geographical diversity and language diversity. Right, right. And so, um, anyways, it's just the, how that happens, right? So in Japan, you're going to get slightly different interpretations of a more of a, a coherent uh, structure overall, but they'll be interpretively different. Right. So, so that's it's interesting to hear that play out. But when when I hear a story like that, um, the the Amaratu being like this the sun representative of the sun in that sense. Yeah. The sun is the life giving. The sun is um, 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 light, which is usually associated very positive. Right. Um, and it disappears. And then it has to be kind of like drawn back out into the world. Right. Um, it always makes me think about because of the connection to the ancient past, like right. really ancient past, um, 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 cataclysmic events. Right. Yeah. Things that, because yeah. um, especially the idea that uh, this is this really struck me when you're talking about this is so something cataclysmic event happens mm -hmm. and monsters are roaming the earth and everything's right. dark and awful. Right. What's the response? Is from the kami in this sense was not to go and fight all the monsters, right. but to celebrate and to develop, to 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 sort of express positive more exp expression, and that draws back the sun. Right. That's really interesting, you, even in today's context, because mm -hmm. if we think about the modern political situation and the problems right. of it, um, um, I, I mean, I say to people all the time, and I I, I know that. The thinking in terms of anything at least to violence is wrong. It's not right. going to work. And I don't want to go in that direction. I want to celebrate the beauty of life. I want right. to engage in good conversations. Yeah. Those conversations don't have to be like perfectly, uh, you know, politically correct. They right, can be right. very, you know, all over the place. But, right. but that's that that enjoyment of even the dirty parts of life in terms right. of understanding it. In that right, sense, right. we have a saying. There's a saying I was taught from my teaching in, in the dojo that goes, um, "You got to start with dirty roots." Right. And uh, that, that's in sense that. So all that stuff's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. But m one of the questions that comes to my mind then is I'm always interested in, 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 in belief structures right. where it seems like on the surface this is like a multiple, like an animistic, like there's multiple different incarnations of this, the divine in different sure. ways. Yeah. But is there a thread in it somewhere where there is a, a singular understanding of the divine, like like we would say, there's one god that over all gods, or anything like that within this idea? Oh, I don't. Not not in Shinto, yeah. and uh, not in the local kami belief. For, for, but local. So, for example, the mountain kami, uh, 
herself, um, I, I, I in, in my research, I've, I've, I've basically kind of created borders. So I've got three characters I'm focusing on. Okay. But most researchers say, mm, there's got to be more. There's, I think there's this and this. For example, the hunting goddess, but she's also the, the woodsman's goddess. Yeah. But the, the, the Shiba, the Shiba Kami. Huh. So Shiba Kami is kind of the, um, that's the closest to the hunting goddess. So she has multiple facets yeah. to her. And I mean, uh, you could look at her as, because um, she's a shapeshifter as well. <laughs> so she's, She's also, if you you know, for example, Mono no Kahine, the yeah. great, uh, yeah. great, uh, what is it, uh, anime of yeah, yeah, Miyazaki yeah, yeah, Hayao. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you see the wolf, yeah. the, the giant white wolf. That's the Yamak. That's yeah. the mountain cat. That's right. She, that's one of her versions. And right. it's, uh, some people say the Tengu, you were mentioning the Tengu, is also one form that she could take on. So, but she, is she exactly all of these things? That's not the way they think about it. Yeah, they don't think oh, there's this one god and she can become all these. She's multiple facets. And if you said, for example, is the mountain god, the hunting goddess, and the woodsman goddess, are they the same? If you said that to them, they'd go, Yeah, maybe, hmm. probably. <laughs> I never thought of that. They don't they, think they that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. They don't, they're not thinking. Are they the same? They're saying huh. that she's there's there. Yeah, yeah. The mountain is the place of the gods and the gods are there and who they are in particular is not necessarily uh, said to be like one overriding goddess but, but could is there any entities that could override the rule of this uh, of, of the, the, the goddess of the hunt in that sense like so anything that could come over and like say no you're not doing that to her is is that exist with her oh i don't not from what i've seen so I, she so she's still at the top of that very loose heart hierarchy in a sense in sure sure but i mean the the the, the, the hunters uh the number of hunters and their ritual participation has de declined quite a bit oh yeah, so, yeah yeah so it's not i mean they still go out and hunt yeah and they it's necessary and they they still do they still have these parties but they're less intense uh, yeah so no yeah they would um yeah i don't so for example if they said if you said to them uh even if you said to uh them that uh for example, um, Amaterasu, mm -hmm. is she more important than mm -hmm. the mountain kami? They, they, they wouldn't be able to necessarily give you an answer that's clear Okay. In, in terms of what we think, which is higher. Of course, Amaterasu is part of Shinto, right? and Shinto and local kami are so intertwined uh -huh. in, in terms of the rituals and act. You, you can't really separate them. Yeah. But when you go on, when you're on a hunt, there's no connection to Shinto. But when you're, for example, getting married or you're, um, uh, whatever, you're, so marriage is, is a Shinto concern. Okay. Uh, so we, we, you, in Japan, they have a, uh, a saying that you're, what is it again? You're born, oh, I can't remember. You're born Shinto, you're married, you're, no, you're married Shinto, you die Buddhist. <laughs> it's not something like that. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because mostly yeah. the... Mostly the concept of what happens after death is is is, is Buddhist, Buddhist concern. concern. Yeah, it's yeah. Buddhist concern. Whereas I, I in my book I talk about the the cycle of life, mm. which was the traditional and it's still believed, but it's it's in that if because you're talking about overriding, most people still now believe in the they their their the remains go to a Buddhist yeah. uh, temple and we have uh, in every most every rural house anyway, you have these things called the. Uh, like a bukyo dama mm. it's it's kind of like a it's like a whole shrine that's for buddhism oh, okay and um the concept of uh death is dealt with in buddhism okay so you but the, the cycle of life was that um the traditional cycle of life from you know the jomo era through until almost recent maybe the last three or four hundred years probably but buddhism slowly has been infiltrating in a, and I don't like that word but becoming integrating integrating right, right. Okay. into okay. into the system yeah. so but uh, but the idea of the cycle of life is you're born into the valley with a pure soul sure that's the concept okay then you go through life yeah. and as you go through life your soul is dirtied mm. and that's where the concept of shukyo mm. comes from uh, not, uh, not Shukyo, Shugyo, my mistake. Shugyo, yeah. Shugyo, Shugyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shugyo, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of Shugyo where you have to 
do something to cleanse your soul. Yeah, that can and be difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. It's difficult. So, for example, in Kagoshima, they had the highest number of samurai, and uh, they had most of the samurai that they had were the Yamabushi. Right. And that the Yamabushi, the bushi meaning samurai. Yeah. Uh, the mountain samurai. Yeah. yeah. And they were um, doing shugyo. They'd mm -hmm. spend. Yeah. a month or two months yeah. just living in these mountains yeah so there was a connection to the Yamano Kami as well they had to be yeah. linked so there's that it's all tied together somehow and there's a sense that you have to clean your soul and then you return to the mountains at death okay and become part with the Kami yeah that's the old system that's where in no theater yeah no theater you have the masks of the the great Joe mask yeah. and Okina mask. Yeah. And the Joe mask is the, the traditional uh, sense that the great hero, who we're, and we're talking going back to Don and Uji, mm -hmm. the great hero who comes through life and has that kind of worn face, mm -hmm. wrinkles, <laughs> worn, yeah. but still confident. And, yeah. and that's how you enter into the, so you want the land. That's, that's, how, you, that's yeah. how you die. Yeah, yeah. That's how you should die. Yeah. Yeah. Where, uh, sorry. My daughter again. <laughs> That's how you die, uh, and then of course it was the great uh, Shinami, uh, Shinami, what's his name? Uh, the great no th no uh, writer, great artist of no uh, from the 14th century, I, I believe it was, hmm. uh, introduced the idea, the the concept of the Okina, hmm. which is this the old man and old and the the Okina is the old man, the old farmer who has gone through a life okay and at the end of life is the way a perfect farmer would be with uh, a smiling face uh -huh. and a kind of <laughs> sort of face whereas the joe is very serious oh yeah it's the hero who's fought it's ready to fight at any time huh. but the old farmer hmm. is gone through is going back into the kami as well and there's a peace that comes from that in that sense. peacefulness yeah yeah and tetsuro um tetsuro yamaori the great uh well, probably the, currently the greatest uh, religious scholar in Japan. Hmm. Currently, that's his research, oh. and he talks about um, he talks about, for example, he, he extends that to the modern world. For example, in twenty twelve, I think it was the Great uh, East Japan earthquake. Right. Um, right. When people, uh, he wrote a great article in the Asahi Shinbun, uh, talking about the peaceful faces of the people. Hmm. Whereas in you know other countries, you might see people going. Ah, screaming and yelling and crying yeah. he's had these smiling peaceful faces and he says that that was attributable to the concept of having gone through life and accepting yeah. the ways of the world he attributes it also to just the, the way Japanese nature is as well it's, it's, it's part of being yeah. alive there yeah so. uh, um, yeah um, on that note um, I always think about what I've learned through my training in terms of um, the, it, like it, the whole thing can be encapsulated to some degree as like a strategy for life yeah. and that strategy definitely has woven into it a very sincere acceptance of death mm -hmm. that you are going to die at some point and you become at peace with that it makes it a lot easier to handle a lot of the crazy yeah. chaos yeah. and that can make all the difference in a moment of stress like a real dangerous situation yeah. and the samurai of course that was their whole thing right? they had to right. be able to go to battle and accept the death on the battlefield very right. easily um, but yeah, there's so many interesting elements to this. I, I want to come back to this though, just because it's, it's something I'm always find really fascinating is how um, belief systems in this way are, or any belief system really, is structured in in this sense. So so it's like it's like it's like if I compare it to like an ecosystem in, 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 as a, as a thing, it's not like any one species is the king of the of the the hill really. Mm -hmm. You know, people make that thing about like lions being the, but no, I mean lions get eaten by things when they die too. Right, right. right. Everything's part of this continuum. Right. So it sounds kind of like that is the framework of their belief structure in this. Oh sure, yeah. Right. There, where there's very powerful deities that in, incarnate in various ways, but none of them are like the absolute, in that sense. Yeah. And that makes me think that it is a uh, not necessarily conscious because it's, this goes back so far in time that people may not have thought of it this way. But you talked about uh, Jung and his and, and Jung, of course, introduced the archetypes and the ideas of frameworks of unconscious thinking that can be consciously seen within these I don't know margins or these, these right. encapsulations. Um, so, so yeah, do you, do you think that? Um, how much of that do you think has really been carried forward in Japan? Because I know Japan's a unique country, 
it has an incredible history. Um, modernization always tends to homogenize a lot of this stuff. Mm. So you, you encountered a strong amount of it in the rural areas, mm. but when you go to the cities and stuff, do you think it's really there still? Mm. That's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, in my book, my book is basically focused on case studies. I, I do a history, historiography, but I also talk about case studies. So I, I did an ethnography. As you know, I lived there and I did, I did the research. And I found my focus from the beginning, my, I, my focus was on my question. The research question was how can uh, traditional beliefs, uh, especially religious beliefs, uh, be used to uh, deal with problems and crises, mm. especially the crisis of modern uh, modernity, right? The crisis, one of the great crises of our times is the, uh, the depopulation, the rural depopulation in yeah. Japan, the loss of uh, those belief systems, and the, ch the young people are being, just being deposited into these yeah. bloated cities where hyper stimulation yeah. and just the, you know, there's just so much, you know, video games and yeah. Go to Izakai's, which I like. Don't get me wrong, but but it's this it's this whole thing of drawing them out, and you know you think maybe they might go back, but will they ever go back? That's a question. That's that is a question. So it is a it is a problem. I think in the cities, uh, in in my documentary, and if you have a chance to look at it, you'll you'll see that I do at I, I do go over that quite in quite, quite oh, detail okay. into the city. So I, I I taught at Kagoshima University, and I interviewed a lot of students. I'd say eighty percent, seventy to eighty percent of them were not quite familiar with mm. the um, belief systems. They couldn't really tell you what it was. I'd say 30% of them had no idea what you were, I was even talking oh, wow. about. Yeah. Uh, there were some people who knew right away. Yeah. They knew. Yeah. They, they, they actually knew. But I in, the, in a documentary, I interviewed two engineering students, third year engineering students. And they're, one of the, I said, what, what's, there's this beautiful statue of the rice god, Tanokansa, which in, in Satsuma is the mountain kami as well. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it's interesting. I, I go in deep, great detail because actually that documentary is on that particular version. Okay. And so she's there. It's this prominent position right across from the, the, the Department of Science and Engineering. Mm. And in, everyone walks by. This is on the main walk throwaway of the university. And I said, well, what, can you tell me what that statue is? And they, they both look, they go, oh. There's a statue there. <laughs> they didn't even notice there was a statue there. Uh -huh. One guy's going, I have no idea. The other guy goes, I think it's the Mizugan, mm. like a water god. Mm. And which is impossible. Water gods never has a, it's never uh, anthropomorphized. More oh, anthropomorphized. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whereas the Tanokasa is, okay. uh, is in the form of a, of a human. Okay. So uh, they finally go over there and they go, the other guy's reading, this, reading the plaques. Go, oh, Tanokan. <laughs> the other guy's going, so it, it, it clicks because yeah. he knows and then if I ask him the other guy completely oblivious okay. but the one he said that, you know, that's the god of uh, harvest yeah. and uh, they, I used to do matsuri or something like that I think uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he's familiar so that's, that's the way it is in, in Kagoshima uh, Kagoshima University and all the the, the school we chose for our children to go to. And one of the reasons we chose the, the, re, the Arakawa as a town is they have this experimental program hmm. trying to bring back the uh, Satoyama. Do you know Satoyama? Yama meaning mountain. Uh, Actually, no, the Satoyama area, literally the oh, area, oh, it's, okay. it's an area between the mountain and the village. It's kind of like a place where there's lots of uh, lots of things come, like lots of beautiful chestnuts and fruits. Oh, interesting. And, okay. So it's, it's a kind of a, it's, it's a place where they used, people used to go and pick okay. things. Okay. So, so, for example, women were not allowed into the mountains because it was dangerous. The, the, mount, the mountain mm -hmm. goddess, she hates women. <laughs> <laughs> Artemis as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she hates women. And uh, so, but the women would go along these paths and pick the, you know, depending oh, yeah. on the season, there was okay, like okay. little things you could get. Yeah. It's, it's, so we're currently, it's part of the uh, idealization uh, of, of ancient Japan. Uh, yeah. So if you go to Japan, you hear the word Satoyama, it's kind of uh, like this kind of beautiful place. Everyone's like, oh, so happy. But it was just an area where there was a lot of sun. Sure. Right. Yeah, okay. So so it's, it's the Satoyama. So, but they're trying to bring back that. Yeah. And they're trying to bring children back into the, uh, the so they're trying to retain yeah. the family. So try, what they're really trying to do is save the, the rural. Yeah. The, it's, 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 so you're back to your idea of what's what's happening now. People don't know. Yeah. So they're bringing these families into these regions. So there's certain, they build a couple little houses yeah. for 
people to come or they'll bus them in from the cities and a lot of kids bus in yeah and these experimental school programs are are fantastic okay they're fantastic so the teachers are bring them out and they're, they're planting the rice mm. and they're learning things they're learning about the mount, the mountain kami mm. uh, they're learning about different things about it and so it's happening mm -hmm. they're, they're aware of it mm -hmm. uh, in the in the region okay. but they're just it's it's pretty hard to deal with them because the cities are so, so exciting yeah so it's yeah um, so one of the elements that uh, comes to my mind strongly when especially when we're talking about the the relationship between the way people view the world in the past towards now is, um, and I'm going to borrow from uh, Jordan Peterson here a little bit because oh, yeah, yeah. it was his him that really got me to really concrete this thought. Right. Is um and he and he refers back to Friedrich Nietzsche. All right. Which is the idea of uh, what he said. You know something to like uh, God is dead and we've killed him. Right. Uh, we've ended the aspect of societal belief in a religious or a spiritual context. Right. And the fallout from that has been the 20th century, right. and the 21st century now. Right. Um, and in Japan, with such a beautiful, rich mythological right. structure, it can mm -hmm. out, the loss of that would be great to me, I, mm -hmm. I think is a very serious problem. So um, it's really inspiring to hear that there's these schools that are trying to get that to be developed again. Because right. it's not like we would make sense to go backwards in time technologically right. and live like they did like six, yeah. seven hundred years ago. But, but there's a value in that relationship to what the, the mountain represents right. as well as the mountain itself, I would say, literally, yeah. because like, like it's so fascinating to me on so many levels, but um, throughout my life, I've instinctually, and then as I got older, more consciously gone out to the mountains to right. seek peace, to seek a sense of renewal in a sense. And right. I realized that this is that process um, it, that they're talking about in the in this context, right? right, right. Um, because somehow going into nature does that. Like it's... Mm -hmm. It resets your nervous system. It resets your yeah. perspective on things. Um, so, so this brings me back to one of the themes in my life that relates to all this is martial arts. Right. Because I know um, my teacher's teacher, uh, in terms of my karate lineage, his mm -hmm. name was uh, Richard Kim. Mm -hmm. He was taught by a guy named Yoshida Katero. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to uh, the founding of the Daitoru system in the modern time with uh, uh, Sokan Takeda. But anyways, they would go out in the mountains and he mm -hmm. would talk about training and eating very little food for the day but doing a hard training and mm -hmm. how, how it affected him. He has this one story I, I think was really interesting where his teacher would got him and another student when they were younger men to go spend the night in a graveyard oh, on the mountain and how his friend kind of freaked out and ran away and never came back to training. Right, right. And it was like this psychological training in that sense. Right. So, so it, 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 my point is though that like the martial arts that have survived through the modernization in Japan and everything have these roots back into these that they can anyways they always right, sure, sure they can and that provides a means that might to me I believe is it help alleviate some of that problem that we have in society where we don't as you said just a moment ago go through the stages of life consciously intentionally right. and accept them um, um, so yeah do, do you do you do you, do you know of anything like in, in the like in BC that where they're doing similar like thinking or is that something that could be imported out of Japan and, and spread? Do you think that kind of thing in the BC? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't know much about what's happening in BC to be honest, but uh, uh, certainly yeah, the idea of what Nietzsche said was the that God is dead, but that really is that the Western God is dead. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that the uh, the the belief uh, we've lost our our way. Yeah, for sure. We've lost our way. We're he talked about the, the concept of nihilism, yeah, and um, the idea that uh, and, and Nietzsche is interesting in that the, one of the reasons I really like myself like Nietzsche is that he he tried to he said that we have to create our own values and, and values because values come through yeah the stories of our gods yes and without when the gods are dead yeah there are no values yeah. there's nothing that you can value. There's nothing that there's just there's nothing. Yeah. There's no sense of value. So that's that's what he meant by that. And a lot of people misunderstand that because mm. it's it, what he meant is there nothing is valuable. There's no virtue. There's no value in anything. Yeah. So that's 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 uh, for sure. That's certainly that was taken up by a number of Japanese uh, scholars as well. But um, uh, for example, Yanagita um, did that as well. Huh. Uh, a number of great scholars from pre-war scholars and uh, Nietzsche was, uh, was and uh, not so much post-war just because of the the taint that mm. was, was left 
but certainly Nietzsche's ideas are important. You will find, where are you going to find the, the problems in Japan right now is that, uh, and is it, oh, sorry, you're saying transferable to our, our world. I think it is transferable because I think the idea of developing a sense of what, uh, if, if there's a true sense of what is valuable. Yeah. But you can't say, I want, for example, I value life or I value my, my grandfather. I, I want to respect, el for example, I want to respect old elderly people. I want to do something for someone. I respect my wife or I, I, there's something that I want, I consider valuable. And, and we, 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 we still in the West probably, we want to do it and we do it and we, through conscious hard acts. Uh, and a lot of people are still, you know, decent people. But um, yet what he's saying is that that value is destroyed when the gods die. So I, I in Japan itself, I, I'd say in the rural areas, the gods are alive. Hmm. And uh, it's not a problem. Interesting. The problem is when... Um, Students are born, young people are born in the big cities. Uh, from what I hear, there's there's just a little bit of a, a shaking of the roots. So I think Japan's in the city. There's 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 there are problems. Developing. Yeah, and 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 that of course is something that not just unique to Japan because the reason I brought up Nietzsche in that concept was yeah. that he, he was definitely talking about the Judeo Christian God, right, yeah. but that disconnect from a, a greater belief system for everyone is going to have some fallout yeah. and um you brought up nihilism as, as 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 a result of that and of course that's what i see happening with mm -hmm. and then i also see something that's happening that's more you know contemporary but people um not having a religious belief will gravitate towards ideological belief in the lieu mm -hmm. of a actual spiritual mm -hmm. belief but because at the center of all that is as you said this idea of value Mm. And if you don't have that value being something that I would see, words words often to me um, like say the word like love or something gets gets yeah. like hallmark carded and then it kind right, of yeah. loses a lot yeah. of its meaning. But um, and so there's words like this. But one of the words that I think I'm, I think can refer to if you're done in a sense of respect is is this idea of a sacred element. Yeah. Now we don't seem to have that in modern technological social media world like there, everything is up for debasing and, yeah. um, and, and and a spiritual system gives you a sense of value that you cherish that life that you're imparted with in that right. sense um, and so yeah I, I really it, this keeps coming up with these conversations I have right. with people right is there's a recognition that there's something missing yeah and then there's the discussion of well what can we do to help bring that back right and how would that even look because as I said I don't see any reason to think we're going to like turn into what the same thing humans were 500 years ago mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's got to be an integration into the modern world that doesn't destroy the modern world functioning too right and um one of the places that this becomes most challenging for me uh, not not for me personally necessarily as much as just for uh, communicating let's say mm -hmm. is the uh, the the woo woo magic -y thinking rejection of that thought right mm -hmm. so we don't like 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 um um uh, superstitions that are just silly and, and mm -hmm. you can see right through them um, uh, people use that as an excuse to disregard the whole thing mm -hmm. right so so um, um, how you get a modern person with a more secular thinking to look at this stuff and not dismiss the part of it any parts of it that are obviously not like literally true and can mm -hmm. be easily debunked in that sense right, right. but how do you communicate the value of it is that it's it's about how you frame your perspective on reality and right, how you right carry yourself because of that right, right. so yeah yeah I think um, well I guess just just for example one of the reasons why I I'm interested in the psychology of it is that um, I follow a number of uh, cognitive psychology of religion scholars and I've read a lot of that and I it's pretty clear that the human mind cannot function without mm. religious belief mm -hmm. it's not possible mm -hmm. so one of the reasons it's not possible is that religion is a human endeavor and why is it because it many scholars linguists as well as as uh, cognitive scholars believe that the advent of language and the advent of religious belief began together so yeah. the, why would that be 
Yeah. So, for example, uh, if we are walking in a forest and we hear a leaf fall, if we're a dog, if we're a human, what, how do we respond differently? So that dogs are also group animals. So yeah. they'll look at that and try to figure out what it is. We'll look at it not from us say what is that thing we'll say our mind automatically goes and imagines ourselves as that thing mm. and we we ascribe to it intention mm. so what is this intention mm. and that is the essence of language itself so the 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 the, 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 lang the essence of language is trying to have the other person understand this intention or, or, or concept to, to create what, what's called discourse spaces. Mm. A discourse space is a place where several people can be involved and there's like a, a place where we're constructing right. some kind of reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that does, that does not happen even in chimpanzees. They don't yeah. have, if you leave the room, you're gone yeah. from cognition. Yeah. Whereas for us, we can still be talking about Uncle Joe who's mm -hmm. gone <laughs> to the afterlife and he's sure. sit, standing there. Sure. We can do that. So it's impossible for humans not to think in that way. So that, that's the first step. The second step in answering your question is uh, that means that people who say that they've given up religion, I think it's ridiculous or whatever, I'm an atheist mm. or I don't believe in anything, they believe. <laughs> and they're, they're open vessels for yeah. Yeah. the most ridiculous ideas. <laughs> For example, transhumanism is the one of the mm. new religions happening now where there's the concept that we're going to become, you know, like robots or something. Robot, the interfaced with the interface yeah. or something. That that it's easy to move that way. But and you can understand why people would be attracted to that when they don't have any centering yes. uh, based on some uh truth. I, I, so oh, you can see from where I'm going, I believe you cannot really move forward without tradition. Yeah. Uh, whether it be Christian, Judeo-Christian, or Japanese traditions, I believe they are fundamental. And I think that the only way for a healthy human being to move forward is to en encapsulate that eons mm -hmm. of great wisdom, mm -hmm. knowledge. And, you, and of course you can say, okay, I don't necessarily believe that there's some guy sitting on the clouds up there. Sure. And maybe, maybe I'm not necessarily believing that Jesus was this or that. But the concept of the, uh, for example, the concept of the uh, uh, incarnation in the Christian tradition, the concept of the incarnation where there's a piece of God in our soul, mm. and so we're both human flesh and God, and that we have to work to become mm -hmm. closer to God. That made Western civilization what it is. Yeah. So if you just give that up completely, yeah. Even though you may not believe that there is that, yeah. then you're just open to any sort of trend or, yeah. or fad. Yeah. And same with the Japanese tradition. If you completely give up the concept of the cycle of life, um, which they haven't in the rural areas, mm -hmm. uh, they have in the city. Mm -hmm. But the, there's still the, the Buddhist concept and the Shinto concepts that, that the Shinto, the way, how to, to act in life is deep. And you, you mentioned the Tao. The Tao is deep in, in Japan. It's yeah. very deep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the most fundamental yeah. aspects of respect for, for ancestors. Yeah, yeah. And that, that it's just a fundamental thing. It, my, you know, I can't imagine Japan without that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Without the Tao, without uh, Shinto, or, uh, well, Buddhism as well. As the, the, there's a lot of greatness. You can, really can't have Japan without yeah. their, 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 the way they formulated the concepts of Buddhism. But yeah. also the Kami... I think Kami is fundamental to, to, to rural Japan anyway. Sure, sure, sure. So, I'm trying to put all this, pull this all together to some little, a little bit. And, and because uh, I think you're hitting all those such important points right now in terms of how society can sort of frame itself to move forward in a way that's positive rather than negative. Um, and this, right at the center of it is this re recognition that human beings need a higher concept of reality to work within um, and that that 
and this is now I'm sort of extrapolating, but it's 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 connected to your relationship to nature. It's connected to your relationship to your own internal dynamics, and 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 I would refer to like whether you're a hunter going to go hunt, and you need to sort of set your internal compass to to do that, right. or you're a samurai going into battle, or you're just taking on your day to day job in the modern time. Right. How you enter into that engagement. Mm-hmm has so much to do with the outcome right but uh, maybe deeper but maybe just in the same level but i don't want to try, go too far in that way but but right at the core of that too is something i've been thinking about a lot lately it's just the relationship between how a person frames their indi- identity right and the morality that they have in their own lives yeah and how those things have to be integrated in order to be stable right. honest and that goes back to that framework of you have a picture of reality in which there's meaning that is beyond just like like monetary wealth or something right, right? where i value my 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 ancestry mm-hmm. as an example of something that has given me the life i have so i'm yeah. carrying that tradition if, even if i'm evolving it right and so okay so uh, in, in I, I i teach martial arts this is something right. i did not mean to do when i was growing up but it <laughs> came about and um i've learned so much from interacting with people in right. the way that this has allowed me to do. Right. And one of the things that strikes me very strongly as I get older and reflect more on it, and I've been teaching professionally for about 10 years, right. so you know, it's enough time to get some sense of it. Right, right, yeah. Definitely still learning. Right. Um, you, you get an average person off the street and you say to them, uh, you don't say this necessarily, but you just chat with them, you get a sense of who they are, and mm-hmm. they have a pretty strong sense of self-confidence, and right. they're pretty well put together, you know, in that sense. Right. And then you put them in front of somebody and then you, you know, do a self-defense drill. Now, right. you're mimicking an attack. You're not actually attacking people, right? right? right, right okay. But you are physically engaging in a way that is that yeah. type of motion. And if you have a fairly well-trained person, they can put the energetic dynamic into it too. So right. it's intense. Right. And the moment that that actually happens with most people, they just crumble. Mm-hmm. Because they've never been put in a situation where they have to really overcome the, the, the stress of that oncoming threat right, 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 to yeah. stay into that centered place yeah and so i think that that connects to the development that if we're, we're going to look towards any sort of beneficial future in this way and, and integrating all this stuff we're talking about right. is a process by which people have to experience that relationship within themselves and within their relationship to the greater world it can't just be like words on a paper right mm. or, or, or words being spoken at a person right. it has to be physiologically experience um, in your nervous system in your in your, yeah. your blood in that sense and so um, I, my understanding is that there's definitely some really beautiful uh, ritualized behavior still going on in the, the old Shinto system and, right. and all that um, and I was I thought it would be kind of fun for you to talk about the components of that to some degree oh sure sure yeah um, I can talk about um, do you mind talking about Buddhism yeah go okay, yeah. Japanese Buddhism yeah, yeah. okay so uh, do you know uh, Kobo Daishi not top of my head, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. But it's, I think, 6th century Japan. He, he went to China. Oh, okay, okay. He's a person. Yeah, he's a person. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. He's a, he's a Buddhist monk. Yeah, yeah. And he went to China and, and he, he studied for many years there and he returned to Japan. Yeah. So I got to say, I'm terrible with names. Yeah. But I think I know the story. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. So he, he came back yeah. and he, um, he set up some several temples and then yeah. he went on a pilgrimage. Right. Around the, uh, for people who are not familiar with Japan, there are four main islands. Yes. There's the Hokkaido in the north. Right. Then what we call Honshu is including Tokyo and Osaka. Yeah. Then there's uh, Kyushu or Kagoshima where I've done my research. Yeah. And then there's a, the smallest of those four is Shikoku. Hmm. It's also the least populated. Hmm. Uh, it's fairly mount. It's quite mountainous actually. Okay. And um, in so from Shikoku, there are eighty eight temples on the pilgrimage oh, yeah. that you should follow hmm. following his path okay and he came back and he set up a a, a very well-known um temple system near just south of kyoto i uh, forget where it is now it's been a while <laughs> beautiful beautiful set of temples but you're supposed to end up there okay but you start right at that tip of shikoku island and across the way is the the set of temples that you would go to so you would just so you start moving along and walking and it's quite a long way it's you know in the west we also have those pilgrimages 
And you're supposed to not carry any food. Hmm. You're supposed to walk and just go through the mountains and uh, basically whatever people will give you hmm. on the way. Hmm. Rice, for example, and uh, whatever they'll give you, like a fruit or something. <laughs> I, I actually was given apples okay. and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, somebody gave me this drink and I was a little... <laughs> right in the mountains. My, it was my son and I were on this trip together. Oh, and like, and we're, this guy just comes up in the car and says, here you go. And he drives off going, I'm sure we drink this. <laughs> 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 but we did. We, we drink. So, so we, we continue. It was fantastic. I met a lot of people, really interesting people. Sure. Uh, it was a fantastic... That's one example of okay. the... Uh, many people, you're supposed to... If you're, if you have any relation at all to Buddhism, and most Japanese do, yeah. they want to go on that pilgrimage. Uh, so I'll talk about the good and the bad of that right now, the modern for version. So one time, let me just tell you one bad story to start mm. off with. We're driving up, and we, we, we're walking up, and we, we there's this one, a couple of them are really high okay. in the mountains. Okay. So we walked up this one kind of path. It took us the whole day. Mm. And we get to the top, and it's beautiful, and... Um, and we are walking around. It's this fantastic in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the mountains. Beautiful temple, and you go there. And you, what you're supposed to do is get a stamp, right? Okay, yeah. You get the stamp. So you got a book. You get the stamp, and we're kind of like, okay, well, we get the stamp. And it, my son's very. He's like, I don't really want to do much, but let's do it. And so we did it, and we're really exhausted. Spent mm. the whole day there, and it's so beautiful, and the, the noise, and the sounds, and the smells. Then all of a sudden three giant tour bus come up <laughs> yeah. up the road right. and all these kind of old ladies like, like in their 70s they come up they're yapping <laughs> they take a picture it's, it's just destroyed then not long after a couple came up in a Mercedes Benz black mm. and they come out they got the glasses on they're super rich and they're mm. around. it was quite uh, disappointing okay so yeah. and, and and currently you cannot for those each of those temples is supposed to have a residence where um, you know people on the pil pilgrimage can stay, sure, completely full uh -huh, all yeah, the time. Yeah, Why? Yeah. Because people drive up; they book them like two years in advance. There's no way you can get one now. Right. So that's that's the that's the sad part. Yeah. That's the yeah. modernization of yeah. something that should be a spiritual experience. Yeah. But on the other hand, we did go up. We did. It was not in the same mountain range. Uh, it was like the third temple. About three days later, we went up even further and we got to a place which was fantastic and there was up in the mount like up the oh, once you were up there at the top there was a, a scale wall hmm. the surface it was about 10 to 50 meters up and there were all these like catacomb like little places and you we asked what what is that that's where many of the monks um, the traditional monks like we're talking a thousand years ago they lived there. Oh wow! They would at night. They would sleep there. <laughs> so they just dug it out of the side of the mountain, and so that's the sense of how oh, work is. Yeah. And also, and to end in the positive, obviously, you meet people on the trip. Yeah. We met a Tokyo businessman, uh, one of the top executives in a big company. He's walking by himself, and we spent three days together talking. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic man. We met a couple of Canadians, uh, a young woman who teaches Buddhism in Kyoto, mm -hmm. and her grandmother. Nice. <laughs> right. nice. So I mean, it was it's a fantastic trip. Yeah. So there's an example, and that's not just Buddhism. Shinto also in, 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 invokes these sorts of. Well, that's 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 fairly common to me in the sense of like traditions getting um, sort of you know watered down or diluted through modern yeah. interference in that yeah. sense. I have I, I always when it come to mind is um I up until just this last year I was teaching Tai Chi at UBC, mm. and um it, it was it was cool in the sense that I would meet a bunch of people from different parts of the world sometimes. Mm -hmm. One young guy came in and he was from uh, India, and his family had a tradition of yoga. Mm. and um, he didn't talk about it much. First, I had to get to know him a bit, and then he got into it, and it was real tradition. Like His family really honored it, and it was mm. a big part of his life, and he was disgusted with what he would see in the trendy yoga Alice Spence, right? And I thought it was, a, it was a good example of that problem, but the thing is, there's still a, a thread there of genuineness mm. if you seek it. Mm. And so I was, I've been told that in the old days, if you, if you went to go to a dojo to learn, you'd be called a seeker. Mm. Right? You're looking for that connection to something mm. that's better and I think that throughout most human history not everybody really honestly had that seeking right so it probably was tainted you know in various ways through well it sure. was but that 
I think the, the thing, the reason I brought up the concept of the ritual and the, the use of ritual, which still exists within these these this, this, this rural areas and all this stuff, mm -hmm. is that it it takes it from the intellectual to the experiential, right. and and that's so critical. I find more as I get older and reflect on it more, yeah, because. Um, like I, I've, you can have a conversation with somebody, and let's say they have a particular sort of neurotic, neurotic patterns, and you right. can sort of you know, talk about it for a bit, and then and then they just go on their life without thinking about it still, and it doesn't change. Right. To get it to change has to be something that goes beyond just the thought level, right? right? And so rituals, um, and I don't mean like dogmatic ritual without thought, like 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 blank, just doing it. I mean yeah. understood and right. engaged intentionally ritual. Right. Because, and this is a big one, a big conversational point, but yeah. I, I, I tend to think through many, many years of training martial arts yeah. that communication is based out of, like, like, like body language is the, for, the, 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 the soil from which verbal communication came. Yeah. And if somebody wants to interact with you, right, like in, in any way, positive or negative, mm -hmm. There's so much communication in how they're standing and how their the body shifts this way or slight right. tension in the jaw or whatever it is, right, 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 right. and uh, that ritual then engages then in that aspect of us that we don't think. Of, I think a lot of people don't think about right, themselves right. in that way. Yeah, right. They, I'm just this my thoughts and I'm just my body is kind of this thing I just carry around and I'm not really concerned about it. But it's right. like that's actually your vehicle for framing everything. Right. 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 So, so I'm, I'm interested in the idea of anything that can help sort of promote a more holistic sort of perspective in, in right. the world. And I think that that ritual has a big part in place there. Yeah. And, I'm, and I've been thinking more about this. I was talking to a friend of mine. Is like, it might even be that we create new rituals yeah. um, that more work with the modern world. Mm, yeah, yeah. But we have to be able to, I think, go back to the old stuff and understand it. Understand why it was done in a certain way. What did, and I think the big, the big one here within the, the Shinto framework of the rural mm -hmm. belief systems is right. the mountain as a representative of the, the unconscious, the, the, the nature and, right. and our role within this framework and all right. of that. And the remembering that it's, it's not giving us an easy path. It's, yeah. it's a path, <laughs> yeah. but there might be boulders and all kinds of stuff right. on that path and dangers and, 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 and how we engage in that. Right, right. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. If 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 you're if yeah, if you look at the history of the mountain, the mountain was the place where uh, men went to do young men went to do uh, rituals. They went to, to well, the hunting, obviously, but the Yamabushi, They went out and they, they lived out there. They, they they embodied themselves. So the idea that of the embodiment, but certainly, uh, obviously, that part I can't see that being. I think that's lost, except for a narrow group of, of mm -hmm. people. But certainly other concepts of the idea uh, in Shinto of the way, right? The way, the concept, how we go through life, how to act, how to act in life. And um, you see that a lot in Japan in the concept. So, for example, when you, um, when you walk into a room and you're aware of the way it is constructed, mm -hmm. for example, you've got... Um, in the farmhouse that we lived in, there was uh, a place called the um, the uh, Bukyo room. Bukyo mm -hmm. is the uh, a bu like basically there's a Buddhist shrine there, but the Buddhist shrine is here, and then up in the corner there's a kamidama, mm -hmm. and it's there's like stones of the gods, and they're watching. Yeah. So they're watching. What their the sense was, what the belief was, is that these are the spirits that we know. Mm. They've recently de departed. So okay. we, we, so so if we're gonna have dinner here, uh, we go to that room. Mm. So the, there'll be a living room where you eat, and there'll be the irori and the, the big pot, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. And we still had that in my house. Nice. Yeah, in Japan, it was fantastic. And there was a sense of ritualistic sense that as we eat, we go there and we pray, and we. We invite them. We put some some kind of food or some part of the food. We actually bring a part of the food, mm. and it still happens quite a bit in Japan. And they put the food there. This is what we're having, and please enjoy. Mm. But there's also a sense that there's the, the kami mm. from the the mountains that comes down to mm. observe mm. the way that the family is working. 
mm. so that the, the way that they're working together. So there's a sense that uh, you have to, the way you behave is monitored in a mm. sense, not in a negative way, but in a, am I doing it right sort of way. So there's that sense. Um, the way that they sit at the table and the way that they act in daily life of, is, is also, a, it's also based on the idea that there's a sense of, of, of that things have to be purely set mm -hmm. because the, the when there's not a purity as we were talking about earlier the, the cycle of life the soul is, yeah. is, is, is dirtied yeah. so the more that we get involved in the dirtiness the more we have to go out and do shooting right. so that might not be what you're looking at though you're probably looking at more uh, how people live their life I think uh, I wish I, I could wish I could say that there's there's a lot of that going on, mm. but I can't necessarily, except for example, in the same way that it is here in the West. Uh, for example, a lot of dojos, a lot of uh, Aikido, I studied Aikido, in a sense that, there's, uh, that there is something that's important. Yeah. How would I say the average person, but I think it's embod there's some embodiment there. Like when you say that, for example, the Japanese house has to be simple. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of plus clutter and it's very simple and that sense that there shouldn't be much in the room yeah. is that that it's not necessarily you're doing something but you're allowing yourself to be in that sort of space yeah yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's like a space that is somehow um, so so it, it affects how your, your actions are so it's not exactly what maybe what you're looking for in terms of of you know, like shugyo necessarily, but it is a sense, in a sense, it's shugyo. Sure, sure. It's because it's you're, the cleanliness and the, the way that you eat and the way that you are approaching everyone and every, and it's, and you, the kami are with you. It's, yeah. it's and the yeah. recently departed are with you. It's, it's, a, it's a sense of, it's kind of, I haven't really formulated that idea well <laughs> enough, but, but yeah. I, I, will, I, will, I will have to put that together. That's it, I'd say my, I talk about it in my book as, as the legacy of, of the mountain kami though, but I, I should probably try to formulate it in that sense. So it's interesting you bring that up. I've just started being, uh, not even being taught, but being introduced to that I'm going to be taught a uh, tea ceremony. Mm -hmm. And um, a part, uh, part of that is the wabi-sabi yeah. uh, thing. And I, whenever you're talking about entering into a house and it's simple, mm -hmm. but you still mindfully uh, recognize the environment and appreciate it, that's, that's part mm -hmm. of that uh, to me. Um, it ties into something I've always really, really liked about martial art training from my experience of it as, as a template for many other expressions, whether it's art or not, is asymmetrical designs. Right. Because, so, so in music, I love music. I've been playing music most of my life. I moved to Vancouver to pursue a professional musician, oh, yeah. but I was into death metal and that's not a very good way to make money. <laughs> so anyways, um, um, I've always really enjoyed the songs that have things that come out of nowhere and surprise yeah. you. Right. That aren't predictable in that way. I really like that, and and like kata, and I'm sure you know what kata are. Yeah. Um, the kata is always the, the katas that we train are always have these weird little deviations, so their uh, patterns are never exact. And, right. Um, and so, so yeah, that's all part to me of the of the beauty of the Japanese folk traditions, mm. and um, it all comes back around to to like how how they were able to sustain that deep connection to a, a sense of, a greater sense of, of their place in the, the world as itself and then their place within the world and their humility within that. It's all these little expressions of it that pop up throughout the culture, mm -hmm. um, um, right from the cooking pots to the, to the house itself to the, mm -hmm. and all this. And of course, my vehicle for understanding this is largely through my training. Right. And one of the things about it that I think is, and, and this is why I keep coming back to ritual, keep coming back to identity, come, all this stuff coming right. together is, is there's techniques that only work when you're in the right state of mind mm -hmm. and that has a state of mind that's definitely not driven by fear or anything like that. It has right. to be very clear. Right. And you have to do things that are totally counterintuitive mm -hmm. in, in a moment of, say, an attack where mm -hmm. you, 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 if you think about like somebody's about to strike at you and your, your hands are down, you're open. Mm -hmm. That's like the least in, you know, intuitive thing you could do. Right. But that's where a lot of it begins to a certain degree right. in that because you're overcoming your natural inclination to disengage right. by embracing the uncertainty and just riding with it. Mm -hmm. And that 
that is expressed, like I can see an expression of that within a simple house mm-hmm. design. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right? And so all those, it's, I, I love how it, the tapestry weaves itself in that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, you've had some training in Aikido, so. Right. Um, 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 I was watching my, I, okay, so I have a student who's, he should be graded, but we haven't had gradings for a while now. Oh, it's one of these things, yeah. but he should be graded, um, but he's still wearing a white belt because he's, <laughs> you know, but he, he's definitely in a white belt. Um, and anyways, I'm just introducing him now because he's still a beginner right. to sparring. Yeah. And, um, I was watching him last night and, uh, do you know the technique Irame Nage? Oh, I don't know. Okay. It's like a clothesline, right? Where you... Right bring your arm across the, the top of the chest here and just sort of drive the person down. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's pretty common in Aikido that they do this. Yeah. But um, it's so many takedowns are basically that, yeah. where you sort of reach out and pull down. Right. And so however you express it, it's all Hiraminage. Right. And I was watching him and he was just doing Hiraminage over and over and over and over and over again. Right. Although he wouldn't know that and he wouldn't have expressed it that way. Right. And each one was slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so this embodiment thing gives I think it gives you this template to understand that there might be a million expressions of mm-hmm. it but there's only one central reality to it in the right. sense and, and it's about that relationship that you're engaged right. in yeah. right yeah, yeah yeah well yeah certainly it's uh yeah I think the wabi-sabi if we go back to wabi-sabi I think the sense of the beauty in things and but there's a sense of uh, of sadness in it and, yeah and and uh, and acceptance of its beauty and acceptance, acceptance of, of what it is. So in this, that sense, my wife is um, also, she has done quite, quite a lot of the tea ceremony cool. study. And so it's expressed in the way she um, decorates the room yeah. and, and she lives her life basically. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. That's, that's a, it's a beautiful sense. Almost similar, almost a little bit different obviously, but uh, uh, mono no aware, you know, that's more of the, the, the uh, understanding of the sadness in things. Okay, I've heard yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a, a sense that uh, the, I don't know, the, the, the most beautiful things are the things that are fragile and the fragility yeah. of things. And yeah. The, so yeah, there's, there's that, that sense and I, I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, there's underlying, almost an underlying kind of thingness to, to, to the world. Well, I, that's that's interesting. That's a whole interesting vein of thought because I think that if you're really honest about what you look at and you look at human life, there has to be like that Buddhist thing, like suffering is part of that. Yeah. And there's that acceptance of that. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that you're happy about suffering either. Yeah. And so like I, I, I think some of the best songs are the sad songs, yeah. right? Like there's a reason that we, we, and I think we need to connect to that once right. in a while because we all experience tragedy to some degree in our right. lives. And it's very pathological to ignore it. Right. So... So yeah, I think that that's that's in a really interesting vein of the wabi sabi sort of thing is right. the beauty and the delicacy and the fragility and the temporal nature of ex- right. those expressions because your life is ultimately that, right? Yeah, yeah. And but that comes back to these fundamentals, right? Is you're right. a part of this bigger picture and you're going to die and you're going to accept that role and yeah. and and you embody that through your daily day life, right. it becomes a lot more serene than it is if it's sure. And then you're you're mentioning that the skill of. Uh, of a tea ceremony is a an acquired skill. Yeah, and it's not not sent not felt to be something that just naturally comes. You you have to learn. You have to learn to appreciate it, to accept it, yeah. and the there is a sense that you can do it, but you have to work at it. Yeah, you have to, you have to embody it, and you have to physically engage in it. And similarly, you were saying. Yeah, and it is of course a ritualistic. Yeah, approach well, exactly. It yeah. gets all those you know check marks. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm quite excited. I haven't begun. I've just been told that it's coming up on the horizon for oh, me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Because um, my teacher, he's a wonderful teacher in, in, in this tradition, and right. he's he's good about saying, "Well, the next thing that will come up is going to be this stuff." Stuff. Oh, yeah. For the summer, we've been working on um, Tachi, which is like the really long sword. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's I don't own one yet because money, but the blade is like. I don't know, the blades are way longer than katana, and the handle is like this. So oh. you have this huge gap between your hands when you're moving with it. Oh, really? And it's fascinating because it teaches you to move in a new way. Yeah, yeah. And sure. this is one of the things that's about the, the training in a koru, which is the old systems, yeah. is you use a whole multitude of different weapons. Yeah. And each weapon has a different range yeah. and a different hand sort of dynamic. Yeah. And then you 
take the weapon away and you realize that's oh that's all for my open hand too and yeah, yeah it's, I loved it that this it's amazing that. did you know that in, in Japan the Aikido they, they use weapons as well oh yeah yeah I was shocked because I <laughs> the idea of Aikido was different <laughs> well I um I, I don't want to go big too much of a big deal about this but um so so I mentioned Richard Kim he's my my yeah. karate teacher's teacher. Yeah. Um, he learned from a guy named uh, his, his Daitoru anyways he learned from a guy named Ishida Katero yeah. Ishida Katero's teacher was uh, Sokan Takeda right. Sokan Takeda was the teacher of Morihei Ishiba right. so it's just a different slightly different split at that point yeah. but it's the same thing and now Ishiba was learning the Aizu Daitoru system right. um, and so that is the old warrior system of the yeah. clan I, I want to actually I was thinking about another podcast I could do with somebody who was an Aikido person and right, right. talk about the incarnations of Aikido because there was right. a number of them. Right. But the earliest ones had a lot of atemi, striking. Oh, yeah. And that's because it was more of a bujutsu. Oh, right. And then it more evolved into more fluid you know, yeah. expression in that sense. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it's, it's a whole fascinating story there, too. Yeah, yeah. I imagine, I imagine. But, yeah. Right. Just, just the person that expresses the greatest technique, whether it's Aikido or Daitoru or karate, whatever it is. It's always about their ability to synthesize their identity, their place in the world, their justification and their, and their sense of morality in the situation they're in, um, and then their ability to accept the oncoming onslaught of right. attacking energy, whatever that is. Right. And you, one of the things I find about it is, like I can watch somebody do techniques, and I can say, okay, they're moving pretty good. Maybe the average person wouldn't get what I'm looking at in that way. Mm -hmm. But when somebody's really masterful, mm -hmm. you could put a person who has no idea what they're looking at, at and watch, and they'd say something about that is special. Yeah. They don't maybe know what to express. Right, right, right. right. There's, so I think that, again, I keep coming back to this, like that's the ritualized embodiment, engaging yeah. in the knowledge directly, all this right, kind of thing, right? right? Well, that, that takes me back to, to Yamawardi Tetsuo, who talked about the, the, no, the no theater, uh, Ziami's um, concept of the Okina and the Joe mask. Yeah. And this is embodied in their way that they have lived life. So you're saying, is there an underlying concept? Y Yamawari would say yes, that all Japanese have that. And I don't know if he believes that it's an inherited thing. I don't think he does, but you know, I've had debates with people who say he thinks it's being Japanese. I don't think necessarily that's true. I think it's that experience, the experience of living the life, the way that it has been um, established in Japan allows you to accept the ways of nature and mm -hmm. of the world uh, right from the very beginning. And then, of course, the, the different uh, bukyo or, uh, uh, or if you want to, the dojos will help you along the way or shugyo, yeah. shugyo in some other ways. Yeah. But the basic understanding is that nature is the way it is. And you're going to die, as we've talked about earlier. It could happen suddenly in an earthquake mm -hmm. or a tsunami or something of this sort. And it's just the way the world is. Yeah. So there's, there, I think there is, I think there's something to it. I'm, I'm not really to, ready to say, to agree full heartedly with Yamawadi that it's a fundamental element. I think, it's, I, think I agree more with you that it's, it's you're, you're living life in that model. Mm -hmm. So the, the way I'm arguing, I've argued when I do my research is that what religion and belief systems do is they give us a model for living life. Mm -hmm. And are we, if we're living life in that way, then we are progressing and we're, we're creating value and we've, we've, we're, we understand the world. We have a frame for understanding the world. So just back to Nietzsche, where when we say that our understanding the Judeo-Christian concept has completely been taken away. Mm -hmm. Those people don't just float through. Well, they they appear to be floating through the world, but they're they're being trapped by different mm -hmm. different frames and different. They're just going this way or going that way, and they're they don't have a frame. So that's why I still believe that most for the most part in Japan, anyway, uh, as far as the Japan I know, uh, like more rural, obviously, but that there is a sense that the world is. The wabi sabi world exists. That the Okina world exists. That mm. there is a cycle to the way that we live, and that there is purpose to mm. the world. And I think it's embodied entirely as, and I think that that does uh, conjoin with your idea that there is um, a more active ritualistic participation. Yeah, uh, 
you know, engaging in, for example, uh, Shugyo or yeah. whatever. But there, if you live life the way that has been fr- framed in a traditional sense, yeah. then you are more, you, you've got more access to understanding value. And there's more, there's more, um, what was the word I always use? Um, flourishing. Yes. More flourishing. You flourish. You yeah. flourish. So that's well, but, and you've said this a few times now, and I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that right at the center of the human experience is value. Yeah. Because um, if, if, if all you value is gold and then you yeah. have terrible relationships with people, I don't right. think that's a really worthwhile yeah. life. But if you don't value your, um, your relationship, if you value relationships to the point that you don't do anything else, you just like live, you know, in a, in a hut by yourself, you know, or whatever, you know, I mean, yeah. that didn't come out very well, but no, well, I understand getting exactly to what you mean. Yeah. 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 And, and, and how do you frame those values? And, 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 and so that comes to like, well, who are you? What is your identity as a person? And how do you fit into the society that you're a part of? And, right. um, this is a whole other thing. There's always the other veins are going in there. <laughs> You had mentioned the Joseph Campbell, yeah, um, and um, the Hero of a Thousand Faces was one of the books I read in my early twenties that just hit me like a punch to the face, right. and I went, "Oh my God, everybody is living this life." Well, not consciously, but everybody could, right? And every and that was I knew that I always wanted to walk my own path. Right, and it was like that. I'm not alone in this. This isn't. Yeah. I'm not crazy. And right. so 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 yeah, all of those things coming together in that way. Um, there's one more um, thread I wanted to touch on yeah. um, about folklore from a big perspective. Sure, sure. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, just finish up and wrap it up at that point. So, yeah, the, the, the only other thing I had preconceived in my mind I wanted to, to bring up, right. um, um, uh, as much as all this stuff is super interesting, and I really appreciate this conversation, oh, it's been great, right. um, um, is, is, is going back to what I, was, what I was talking about, like trying to make like map out the, this, this belief system and how it, it, it's not a purely hierarchically stacked, perfectly right. linear in that sense. But um, I've always been interested in mythology, beliefs, how people frame this. Yeah. Right at the center of a lot of belief systems that I, from what I can see, and, and this is my investigative mind, mm. is um, a, a, a utilization of the framework of astrological processes. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the term of astrotheology, mm-hmm. and then there's you know there's there's people that talk about like like the Jesus being related to astro like um, astrological movements and this stuff. And, and I don't necessarily believe any of this hundred percent, but I'm curious if there was a thread of the folklore that you're aware of in the Yamabushi and uh, and the Yami, the Bush the Kama, right. Right. Yeah. Ka- yeah. yeah. Um, that relates to a belief in in, in that aspect of things. Hmm. Possibly, um, I I know that uh, for example, my wife believes in the but this this is a Chinese calendar that, that yeah, but that would have been used. imparted yeah. yeah, but it would have been like a lot of other China like the Taoist thing where we would have just right. emerged into it and the Tao as well yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if the kami has that to be honest I because it's more um, the traditional the, the the way it was in the past is that it was on cycles of uh, long cycles so. And short cycles, so the yeah. cycles of the day. Yeah. So you would start um, from your house and you'd go into the valley and return. Sure. There's the short cycles. The long cycle was you were born into the, into the valley, and then you slowly return to the mountains. Mm. So I'm not sure if it's astrological, but um, um, no, I, I can't see any any idea there. But other than the Chinese calendar and um, uh, how about Yakudoshi? Doshi. There is the Yakudoshi. Uh, Yakudoshi is a, I mean, it's a Shin, now currently a Shinto concept where and I, you do it at particular times in your life. Mm. And it's kind of shugyo ish, but it's, it's also related to other a- aspects that I'm not particularly familiar with. Okay. Where you first, in my case, I first did it when I was 42. Mm. And the same year, my father in law was, I don't know, in his late 50s. And he was, he was Yakudoshi year. So there's that. It is an astrological element that okay. by year, how old you are. Okay. And I'm not sure where it develops from or where it derives from, but it certainly has kami aspects in it oh, yeah. that I was able to identify. So basically what you do is you go to the Shinto shrine and you, when you go to the shrine, you, we go through a lot of different ritualistic elements. And there's this thing called a um, Hito, I think Hito Dama. Okay. It's, a, it's a white paper shaped like a person. Okay. And the, priest takes it and wipes it across your entire body. It's, it's basically 
absorbing hmm. evil ah. from your body. And so because <laughs> at, at that particular year in your life, huh. you're prone to be, you know, attack hmm. by evil spirits. So that's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I was a little bit, but my wife forced me to do it. She said, you're, it's bad luck, you got you got you might die. I'm like, okay, okay. And anyway, it was her, fa- her father's, uh, okay, yeah. uh, so, so we did it. So I was like, mm, I don't know if I believe this. But anyway, but it was taken, basically absorbing. And the one, of course, the white paper in Japan is, does that. You'll find it at every Shinto shrine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sumo wrestlers wear it. Yeah. It's, it absorbs the evil yeah. uh, elements. And it's yeah. p- connected to the ancient Kami belief yeah. that uh, as you go through life, there's evil. Evil's just out there. Yeah, yeah. you can't avoid yeah. it. It's yeah. out there. It's it's coming to you. That's why you have to do shugyo. Yeah, and uh, so this part though seems a little bit different from just standard shugyo because you're not really doing anything. The priest is doing it, and they're taking it out. And it's related, as you say, it's it's a time by the calendar. Interesting. And um, it's been adapted to the Western calendar because of forty two and all these sort of things. So. That might be related, so that and what they do it by the end of that is they, they throw it in the river, okay, and it, the river takes yeah. takes it out to the ocean, yeah. and then you get a big bottle of uh, shochu, <laughs> <laughs> and you sit there with a priest and drink. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. It was it was okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know that was that was that that was a uh, so there are there are definitely cycles related yeah. to to the the movement through life though I don't I don't know if it's astrological. Yeah, I'm um, not sure. It, this is more of a, just a general interest I have in, in, in is like how did people, especially initially in human history, frame up um, their understanding of the concepts of the world? Right, right. And um, there's definitely patterns in nature, right? And that would have been hugely important for hunters and right. whatever Absolutely. else. But um, it's always interesting to me how the early peoples, any peoples really, would look at the the, the patterning in the stars right, yeah. and and relate that to something tangible in their lives, because. The stars are such a bizarre abstraction, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no direct relationship, really, but then right. there is. Like, yeah. It is fascinating. So I, I'm always curious about that in that sense. You know what? I, I would certainly postulate that, uh, even though we don't have records of that, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Something, yeah. Everything that we see, there's probably going to be some aspect of it was influenced by, uh, because I know for sure that the shape of the, of the valley and the, the environment that the people lived in and just how dark and yeah. foreboding the, yeah. the, the mountains are. These things shape the belief. Yeah. So yeah. there's no question that the environment that you live in, and, and of course the sky, yeah. would shape your yeah. belief system. I don't know, I don't have any information on it, unfortunately. Yeah. But certainly, there, it, it definitely had influence, I'm sure. sure. Well, I can tell, I can tell one little, little anecdotal thing, but um, is there's a training uh, technique that I learned that has a story attached to it that yeah. ties into it thing right. where the idea was to trace the crescent moon oh, yeah. with the with the kaseki the tip of the blade oh really and then that teaches you how to do this certain particular kind of cut ah. and so it, it, i always find that fascinating because yeah. it's taking uh, something that's like you know external and right. then sort of internalizing it through your own effort and right yeah yeah so right yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, so the, so many of these things we could, we could go in multiple directions. I could I could tell. Yeah. Um, we could probably chat for hours. I probably would like to do another one actually if you want. Uh, yeah, talk about definitely. Any, any of these beginning points, I could go in multiple directions. Yeah. But um, sort of to, to bring it around a little bit. Um, I like how we already talked about um, elements that can be learned from this study that could potentially help the world go forward. Mm-hmm. We're in a really strange and potentially. Well, just a strange place, let's yeah, say, yeah. Um, and 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 like any other strange place, some of it it could become more negative or more positive. There's right. a lot of opportunity in that. There's right. the, um, and um, so from that framework, I I try to do my teaching. Right. I try to actually, I I never thought I would do this, but I I've been doing an online qigong class. Qigong what class. Is qigong. Qigong. Um, just. Uh, key, key, yeah, ah, yeah key yeah. gong because it's energy, just energy. Yeah, yeah. Hell, it's like a yoga thing in a yeah, sense, yeah. and it's all just these like to me they're more like supplemental one of my martial art training right, things. Right, right. But I picked up a lot of them over the years, right, right, and some self care stuff where you you know maybe you just massage a pressure point or something, right, right, right. And I've been doing it online uh, for the last year uh, right. since the pandemic, and I'm getting starting to get feedback from people that it's really helping them. Yeah, yeah. and it's because I think I think because it embodies process there's a ritualized nature to it there's an engagement of of gratitude for the knowledge in that sense 
And so that's my little attempt to help, right, in that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. Um, but um, if there's anything that you would like to throw into that uh, category and say, you know, these things that I'm doing or I'm looking at trying to do to engage in, in this mess of the world we're in. Yeah, all the, yeah, the mess of the world. Yeah, I think, I think again, but just, just to go back to value, we have to find a value and what, what is the... But you can't just find value in the world necessarily. There's, there's, you, I think going back to whatever tradition is your tradition, and of course borrowing from other traditions whenever possible. So like I've lived 25 years in Japan, so I'm as as, as Japanese as I am Western, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But just to try try and find value in 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 the the beauty of the world, the things of the world, and yeah. and not. You know, as you said about the idea, understanding that we're all going to die, or all these 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 the, the tensions and, and pressures that we have, the the breakdown of society uh, that we're seeing is is quite uh, problematic. Most people are probably worrying about inflation and all other sorts of, you know, uh, uh, hopefully temporary <laughs> issues. <laughs> but but it's uh, but how do we uh, how do we deal? I, I just I think that yeah, going back, um, if there if you if there if anyone that's listening to you currently in the Japan has ended the pandemic, for example, you can visit Japan freely now. I would recommend going to Japan mm -hmm. and um, not going to Tokyo. Well, obviously people want to go to Tokyo. That's fine. Kyoto is beautiful, but getting out into the yeah. uh, and finding like before going, uh, we we talked briefly about um, well, you talked about martial arts. And uh, I mentioned about the uh, the Shikoku um, mm -hmm. a walk, mm -hmm. Komodaishi's walk. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to participate in that sort of mm -hmm. event, uh, maybe going to small, even small matsuris in the summer, uh, going to, to finding out what's happening in the local areas, yeah. and uh, th this and just kind of finding what what is valuable for these people and talking with actually talking with them. Trying to to speak, I I find that the, the not not necessarily going like to bars and yeah. hanging out, but getting into the getting into some events yeah. and finding out what Japan's about. And Japan is a very different um, place than anyone could imagine. <laughs> not having gone there, yeah. it's it's a very I mean it's, it's from one extreme to the other, but there's so much that you could do if you if you're interested in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But other than that, I think it's just yeah we're we've got a lot. To, to do about so finding our own <laughs> don't <No> we <laughs> exactly right um, that's that's great uh, uh, to hear and um, yes I, I need to visit Japan that's definitely yeah. on my list I hope you I um, um, I wanted to visit Japan um, and I want to visit Okinawa oh, yeah. and which is part of Japan now but right yeah uh, because of the karate connection right and then um, you know I don't know if we'll ever get to the central mountains of China necessarily yeah. but that would be another place I would mind seeing right, at some point right. because of the connection to the the, the Wu Dang, the Taoist tradition, and right, everything. Right. But um, but yeah, no, my life has been greatly, greatly, greatly benefited from my knowledge and yeah. exposure to these traditions. Yeah. I have so much humility and gratitude for yeah. for this knowledge to come to me because mm -hmm. I didn't go looking for it really. Yeah. I just noticed that hey, this guy seems to really. That, you know he's, he's well put together and I like yeah. what he's saying and yeah. these are like martial arts these are amazing techniques right, right. suddenly I realized that it's become part of who I am yeah. and then um, I'm very humbly trying to carry that tradition forward to some degree yeah. because I think it is what's trying to help and I think and, and yeah to come back to just an ending point the thing is like you said is you go to Japan and you go outside of the city and you talk mm -hmm. and, you, and you get to know people yeah. and I think that that's that as much as Japan's fascinating for me and for you obviously too but Anywhere in the world like that, really. Yeah. I think you can gain so much. Absolutely. And that comes down to communication. That comes down to a willingness to see another person as a valuable source of information yeah. and a part of the bigger tapestry that you're a part of, which is part of that bigger framework right. in that sense and, and, and that sense of sacredness in life and, yeah. and all of that. So yes, yeah, so those are those are good thoughts towards the yeah. positive. Yeah, and um, well, it's very easy to, 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 to miss the sacred aspect of other cultures as well because mm. they're not necessarily going to give it to you. Yeah, you have to you have to earn it. You want to you know participate in it. And, yeah, and understand it. Yeah. Um. I, again, I, I I I'm so grateful for my training because I think the training has given me a framework to understand that better. Mm -hmm. Because you you sort of just develop this second sense to it in a way mm -hmm. almost where you're like I know. I can see the reverence a person's putting into their behavior at a certain time. 
I did a sweat lodge ceremony. A few, I've done a few of them, but I did one particular one that really stood out to me because I realized that the, the medicine man guy who was running it, mm-hmm. I could just sense from him the same thing I get from my, the more advanced teachers I've trained with. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, there's something about this that right. totally separate lineages and traditions right. in different parts of the world, but they're coming to this, well, this inner peace thing, really, yeah. in a lot of ways. And yeah. However, you come to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a positive. Exactly, exactly. Well, but I think yeah, I think it's uh, I think the the sacred traditions allow that. Yeah, that's why that's yes. why when we talk we talk about the great wisdom. Yeah, uh, eons of wisdom. The, yeah, the great. The, you, if you just give it up willy nilly, <laughs> and then you say, okay, now I'm going to try and be a robot or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't I don't see it being effective. I think you certainly you want you can't live like we did say a thousand years ago yeah but we can certainly find uh in that wisdom in our in our own traditions and other traditions that we can show respect to and yeah. and understand and learn from yeah. i think yeah yeah well that's what we're hoping to do i'm hoping to do i'm trying to do <laughs> yeah. just fitting in yeah um that's largely part of the reason i put this podcast together um, and so, yeah, thank you for coming and sharing right. your thoughts and time. Appreciate it. I, um, I found a very interesting conversation, and uh, I would like to potentially do another one at some point. I would, I would greatly appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you very sure. much, John.